of this uh, boot camp. It's my great pleasure to introduce Val Tannen from the University of Pennsylvania. I have a couple of things to say about Val. Uh, these days, or I'd rather say these years, he's been working on database theory, where he's made numerous contributions, including important contributions on the topic of his talk, data provenance. In addition, he has produced a very a long list of very distinguished uh, students, including Dan Schutzio, whose name I mentioned yesterday. But actually, Val has another quality that makes him very special for our program. He's one of the very few database theorists who's very comfortable with categories. <laughs> <laughs> because indeed, if you can call it a quality. A quality, <laughs> is a quality. In fact, uh, he did his PhD at MIT and uh, on lambda calculus, correct? And, uh, and uh, he, if you go to his web page, you will see that he has been successful in explaining monads to his children when they are toddlers. <laughs> so, so I think with this, uh, you can see why he's been invited. <laughs> A very special definition of successful. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, it's the last talk of this boot camp. Yay! <laughs> So uh, thank you for still being here. I'm actually uh, surprised. Uh, so uh, this is a slightly more uh, uh, suggestive uh, talk than the one, the shorter one that was put in the program, which I first gave to Fokion. Because this uh, talk is about provenance tracking. And I'm going to try to explain why is that important. But let me first uh, say that right away that I was um, lucky to have a remarkable uh, a list of remarkable collaborators um, which appear here. I should also say that the first of these collaborators, TJ, um, is actually um, here at the Logic Blocks in Berkeley. Three of his colleagues are here. And he was here for Fokion's talk, but uh, apparently he ran away for this one. <laughs> No, he had to catch a train. So, um, right. So, uh, not clear what data provenance is, and it's like one of those terms that were uh, used and abused. Uh, you often have to see examples to understand. I will try to to explain to you what I understand by data provenance, but you might find in computer science uh, people, especially from the systems side, uh, who take a, a much more practical and perhaps uh, less structured and uh, perhaps less interesting view of what they call data provenance. Uh, so for many, in fact, uh, just tracking uh, provenance means just maintaining an activity log, you know. So whenever you touch something interesting, you record the fact that you did, and then you have a log of what happened, and that's, you know, they're happy with that. Uh, that's all they need, perhaps. Uh, but in fact, uh, as uh, systems try to take advantage of having data provenance information, um, something else has emerged that has turned out to be a lot more exciting. I would call it a processing-based approach because it has to do with data processing rather than just data. Uh, therefore, it has to do with computation. It did arise in databases uh, in, you know, since around 2000 and so on as uh, an absolutely fundamental paper was written by Peter Bunemann was also very influential in general uh, on those of us who, are, who worked on this uh, topic. And uh, Peter, together with uh, Wang Chu Tan and Sanjeev Khanna, um, wrote a paper that changed somehow the perspective of what is data provenance. I should add, for those of you in programming languages who, are know, who know about information flow approaches, 
There is a certain relationship which I would like to elucidate formally eventually, uh, but I've been liking to do that for so many years that I'm starting to worry that, um, uh, that will there be a time. Surely one needs a student for that to happen. And uh, we're going to be more ambitious about provenance, and I will go as far as actually talking about provenance analysis. Uh, as in algorithm analysis, and then maybe this is a little too, uh, you know, too much chutzpah if you want, but let's see what you think at the end. So processing-based perspective uh, talks about some computation uh, that is happening between an input and an output, and the question of provenance is interesting uh, in those cases when the input is a largish collection uh, structured in some way, collection of items. So there are many different uh, data items in the input and it's interesting, you would like to distinguish their contribution to the computation, it's in interesting to do so. The output may also be structured, um, but ultimately, you know, uh, being theoreticians, we're going to consider perhaps Boolean things and we just want to distinguish <coughs> the influence of the input on whether the output is true or false. Um, so the kind of questions that people working in this area would ask themselves are like this. So they might ask, well, which of all these input items are used in producing a given output item. So we just go on one of these things here. We say, well, this is in the output. Well, which of those, perhaps not all of them, uh, if it's going to be interesting, then certainly not all of them, have actually are, have been used when we produced a certain output. And this is essentially the log-based uh, approach. Uh, and it's somewhat boring. Uh, but it figures, you know, in my various uh, slides as which provenance. A more interesting one, which is the one that I alluded to in the previous slide, is um, a question that says why is a given in item in the output? And this is different from which inputs contributed because there could be perhaps alternative reasons involving different subsets of the input. And an even more comprehensive way to understand what's going on could be called how. How were all those input items and the various subgroups of them that, that made uh, a uh, difference, how are they used to produce a given output item? And this is a little vague when I say how, because clearly it can mean anything. Uh, and hopefully we will clarify. So uh, now that we understand uh, <clears throat> these kind of questions, uh, I would like to be a little more specific in talking about two classes of uh, applications uh, that uh, we've identified so far in this area. Let's call the first class uh, causal analysis, and you'll see what I mean. So consider an uh, output uh, item, little o, and the first one is, deletion propagation. So suppose some of the input items disappear, are deleted. Uh, does uh, little o still stay in the output or does it disappear too? So this is a very old, uh, you know, it's an instantiation of a very old problem. Um, causality is understood by counterfactuals. So if some of the input I, uh, items are such that their disappearance causes the disappearance of O from the output. They are called counterfactuals. Uh, <clears throat> another more practical, uh, so this is practical too, because we, uh, we, do, do, we do need to make changes to the database. Um, a very practical question in science nowadays is, is trust. And the simplest form of trust is binary. And some of the, you can say, some of the input items are trusted and some are not trusted. And then here is an output item. Can it be obtained only from trusted items? Or every way of obtaining it is from involving some untrusted items. You'd like to know. Um, another, <laughs> this doesn't look like it has much to do with the previous, but would be access control. So suppose that you don't have uniform access to the input items. There is a clearance procedure for each one of them, like some are public and some are top secret and what have you. 
And now, uh, well, if I look at a certain output item, what should my clearance be to be able to read it, to look at it? That's also a provenance problem. Uh, and then the one that uh, um, Fokion actually discussed in some detail. Um, so look at this item uh, O is in the output. That's a probabilistic event. And if you have some probability distribution on the input, um, well, what's the probability that that O actually ends up in the output? So uh, this is not all. And very interestingly, more is, uh, has been asked from provenance, which I would call quantitative analysis. So uh, one would be cost. You know, sometimes data has cost. And you would like to, you know, if your input items have different cost, you'd like to figure out the cost of actually of a given output item. Uh, another interesting uh, application is you refine the binary trust to, let's call it, confidence score, non-binary trust. So instead of sort of knowing whether you trust, instead of assuming whether you trust or don't trust an input item, you just say, well, I have confidence 0.3 in this one and confidence 0.9 in this one, and then what confidence should I have in this particular output item? So uh, that's already plenty for me <laughs> um, to, to justify that data provenance can be used in interesting ways. And uh, what I would like to, since we have already a whole bunch of different applications, what I'd like to pose it as a critical test for what we will be uh, exemplifying is that we would like to compute provenance basically once, the same provenance, and then specialize it to somehow uh, be able to answer any of those five questions, or maybe several of those questions, or questions like those. Some of these questions are more than one question, if you think about it. So that's a, that's a critical test that will be fulfilled by, will be passed by what I will show you. Now I'm going to throw a teaser at you. Uh, although I'm not going to show you formally how to deal with these things. Uh, here is a problem that we all know. It's you know shortest path. So the shortest path from A to F uh, is A, C, F. Uh, but then you ask questions like, what if a certain edge, like C, is down? What happens then? What's the next shortest path? What happens then? Uh, what if I don't have clearance to use some edges, you know, like they go through forbidden territory? Um, what if C is down with some probability because it's maintained by some lousy maintenance crew? Um, what if I trust edges to different uh, confidence scores? What would be the confidence score for my shortest path? And it turns out that in some sense uh, this can be seen as a special kind of extended data log problem. And although I'm not going to show you in this talk, um, it can be handled with the methods that actually I will describe. So the key to our approach is somewhat philosophical. And uh, I do hope that here, you know, it's the kind of stuff that Samson likes and that I hope to <laughs> talk to him about. It's because here also there seems to be, uh, th there seem to be some, some fundamental aspects of information that are at play. And it would be fascinating to know whether there are parallels in, say, what he's doing. So. Uh, the key is to distinguish two ways of using data items. So we consume the data items for the input, from the input, and we notice that as we consume them, we do it in two different ways. One is a call, what I would call a joint way. In other words, I use two data items actually together, more than two perhaps. I use them together. And that's kind of like keeping a log. But the equally important is to consider when I can use data items alternatively. So I get the same result, but I can use it, obtain it through various alternatives. And this is essential, for instance, when you try to, to reason about trust. Because it would be nice to know that I can still trust something, even though some of the ways of getting it are bad and untrusted, low confidence, what have you. But there may be others that are acceptable. So in the end, 
we'd like this, to find all ways in groups of input items the, for how many times the items are used and all that. So uh, all that was general, but now we're going to look at specifically at what happens with processing of databases, specifically relational databases. I will start with those. And in relational databases, we have these queries of the kind that uh, Fokion has lectured about. Uh, we call um, the result of a query sometimes a view. doesn't matter. But So here is a very uh, toy example that has an input. And what are the input items here? And what are the output items? Obviously, a nice granularity to work with would be the tuples in relational databases. So if I look at this output item O, which is this tuple D, I may ask, well, what's the provenance of this output item in terms of the different input items? So. The key, the, the second sort of salient aspect of our approach is that provenance is going to be computed by propagating annotations. And as we have sort of implicitly discussed about the provenance of a data item, here we're going to make it explicit and actually consider, for instance, a tuple like ABC to be labeled or annotated uh, with a particular provenance P. And an operation uh, like join, um, which involves two tuples, if you recall, um, can be uh, annotated by some kind of combination of the annotations of the two tuples that were combined. And for the moment, we're going to stay completely abstract, and I'm just going to use a an arithmetic uh, operator times here, but I don't necessarily mean that this is multiplication. It's just uh, an abstract operation. And what we see here is an instantiation of what I called before joint use of the data. When you join, you use, or in particular Cartesian product, uh, you use both provenances. At the same time, there is this other way of propagating annotations, which, for example, comes about in unions uh, of relations, where you may have the same tuple in two relations. And when you take the union, the tuple is recorded there. And its provenance is another combination of the provenances of that tuple in the previous relations. And here, I, here there is a different operation. I'm going to denote it by plus. And this is an example of alternative use of data. ABC is here either from the first relation or from the other. And I record this with plus. Interestingly, the projection operation that uh, uh, was another fundamental ingredient of relational databases uh, is also an instantiation of this plus. So if you have, for example, a projection in which you get rid of the C column, uh, it can happen that the rest of the tuples are, in fact, the same, AB. Well, AB ends up in the result. Uh, but now here we record a combination of the provenances of all the input tuples they contributed. But what combination? The alternative use combination. So yes, please. So that's a little bit of a design choice, right? Because yeah, yeah. you could think of it as being some other kind of So you could think of the So a for the moment, the, the design choices are, are very minimal. I'm just throwing two operations in, in play. And I'm just saying, well, uh, I could uh, equally well, uh, um, you know, instead of using operations, use a set or a bag of PNR. No, I'm saying that for the interpretation of projection as the, the plus of P, Q, and R, yeah. it, Maybe it's just as valid to think of it as, you know, I, I took the A from the first tuple and I took the B from the second tuple. I, I, I don't know. It, it well. might be, but it doesn't fit with, I'll explain in a moment, that it doesn't fit with the normal semantics of relational algebra. And I'll explain exactly how. Yes? You are assuming that the plus is associative, right? Yes. <laughs> OK. So 
boom, here is, <laughs> okay, don't worry, you don't have to understand what this query does, but it has a whole bunch of uh, natural joins and projections and union and stuff. And uh, I would have loved to use a less uh, complicated query, but I also need to produce some provenances which are interesting enough to talk about. So here is what uh, applying systematically what I just showed you yields. Uh, there is one extra item that I didn't talk about, uh, one extra operation I didn't talk about, and that's selection. And for that one, we are going to use multiplication with 0 and 1. This is fairly arbitrary, but it will work. And uh, if we have time, I, I can argue this, but um, just bear with me for that. So two special, 0 and 1 are two special annotations, which will now have an interesting meaning. And uh, um, I'm just going to multiply with them. So summary so far, we have a space of annotations. I don't know what it is. Let's call it k. We have k relations which, in which every tuple is annotated with some element from k. We have these two binary operations, times and plus. They correspond to union and projection and so on. And we assume that k contains a special annotation 0 and 1. And now I can already give you a hint. So, so zero should be understood as the annotation of absent tuples. So if you want, uh, the tuples that stay there are those in the support. Uh, one uh, has an interesting meaning. It can be understood as a neutral annotation. This can be derived from various examples. In other words, no restriction. So from a provenance perspective, that data, data annotated with one, comes for free. You don't have to worry about tracking it. It's always there. It's like, you know, given by God. So um, what do we have here? Algebra of annotations. What are the laws of this structure? So you already know where I'm going with this. Because it turns out that uh, to go for these laws, I actually looked at the operations that relational algebra, or the equivalences that relational algebra satisfies. And these are not abstract equivalences. They are actually used in implementations, in optimizations. And it says there, these optimizers use the fact that union is associated commutative, that join is associated commutative distributes over union projection and selection commute, la, la, la. One thing that we usually think is part of the relation algebra is that the join of a relation with itself and the union of a relation with itself is that same relation. In other words, these are idempotent. But that's actually not true for, if you think for a moment, it's certainly true for the set semantics, but it's not true for what Fokion called bag semantics, which I also want to cover as a particular case here. And of course, equivalent queries should produce the same annotations. And that leads you to a very simple to prove proposition that if you want to extend relation algebra to k relation algebra, to the uh, algebra of k relations, and you want these identities to hold, then this k plus, zero, plus times 0, 1 has to be a commutative semiring, if and only if it's a commutative semiring. Um, and uh, it's nice. <laughs> uh, it's, it's indeed a structure, like Samson said. It's a structure that sort of raises its head in many corners of computer science. It's actually a very useful idea. So for every commutative semiring k, we have a k annotated relational algebra. So we already generalized relational algebra. OK. Uh, let's first see uh, what it gives us to begin with. So using just the commutative semiring axioms, uh, I, whatever was annotated by 0 disappears. And what we get is polynomials. What kind of polynomials? Multivariate polynomials, who are the indeterminates? The indeterminates of these polynomials are annotations of the input, of the tuples in the input. So I kind of assume that the tuples are there in the input for some reason p, which is indeterminate, but only in order to figure out what the dependency is between the tuples in the output and those in the input. So p, r, s are indeterminates. And now I'm, what I'm going to have here are these kind of multivariate uh, polynomials. And the coefficients are going to be natural numbers. No negative stuff here, because so far I've only worked with 
the Select Project Join Union, the so-called positive fragment of query languages, of relational query languages. And the claim is that these polynomials capture a remarkably general form of provenance, which I can explain on this same example uh, as follows. So what would be the provenance reading of uh, 2R squared plus RS? So that was the tuple D that I pointed out at the beginning. How is uh, this tuple obtained from these three input items? And 2R squared plus RS tell me that there are three ways to derive this tuple, D. Two of these ways, <laughs> uh, they are different, but two of them use R twice. Uh, the third one uses only R, uh, uses R and S and once each. So the exponents correspond to the number of uses, the multiplicity number of uses of the tuple. Uh, the coefficients correspond to the number of ways in which uh, essentially the same uh, bag of tuples is being used for the same result. Uh, now, we don't have really time to decipher this. It's usually a little mysterious why there are two different ways, but this query is complicated enough that these self-joins actually, there are different self-joins in different parts of the query that yield this tuple. So good things. These provenance polynomials have polynomial size. It's an interesting coincidence. <laughs> um, and therefore, RP and RP time computable. And I, I hasten to add, this is data complexity, because you will complain I that. Mean, if we have a query in positive relational algebra, right? Uh -huh. Yes, I'm still, I'm still in positive relational algebra. When you go to data log, this is not true anymore. Um, and uh, the, the size can be exponential in the, uh, in the size of the query, but in terms of data complexity, um, they are p-time computable and of, uh, therefore of polynomial size. Now, is it p-time complete? I actually don't know. What do we know about the complexity of bag, uh, of the positive relational algebra on bag semantics? I don't know either. So uh, maybe there are, there's a way to sort of uh, show p-completeness there. Uh, it wasn't a major worry. It wasn't a major worry for us. OK. so. Uh, deletion propagation, which I mentioned at the beginning, can be already recovered. It's a low-hanging fruit, as they say, uh, as follows. So if I have the processing that I showed you before, and I want to know what happens if one of the tuples in the input is deleted, for example, this one, DBE, uh, it's very simple. To delete it, you set R equals 0. And setting R equals 0, in this re annotated relation is going to give you exactly the right answer. Two of the tuples disappear. And that's the only thing that, that is end up. So um, this has actually been uh, treated in some other uh, papers in, uh, uh, in database theory about causality and counterfactuals and so on. It's the same story. But what's really interesting there is is actually um, somehow getting a, uh, different scores of importance for different, uh, for different counterfactuals. Uh, but this actually is true, and we, we used it in a system for data sharing called Orchestra. Um, so commutative semi-rings. Are there commutative semi-rings which are useful? So well, I mean, if Samson used them, uh, they must be. <laughs> but Samson only pointed out to two, I believe, yes? Three, OK. Well, as here's a whole bunch more. <laughs> um, so uh, several of the semantics that have been, different semantics that have been considered for database queries are captured here. Certainly, uh, you know, the set semantics and the back semantics that was uh, discussed in Fokion's talk. Uh, something he didn't talk about, um, he alluded to, uh, incomplete databases. Uh, is an old piece of work, but still rather remarkable. Um, when uh, in, in 84, Emilinski and Lipsky introduced what we call conditional tables, which end up being exactly annotated relations, but the annotation is from Boolean 
uh, with Boolean expressions. Um, and uh, the probabilistic work that uh, he referred to, that Fokion referred to, actually was preceded by somewhat uh, less deep work in the 90s, just trying to figure out what it means to do probabilistic databases. And you can say that what uh, that work did was actually to label the um, the tuples with events, the event that the tuple is in, and just sort of calculating, also using Boolean expressions, of course, calculating how the output events depend on the input events from which you then move on and compute uh, probabilities. Much more interesting uh, is uh, the use of semi-rings for application. In other words, in particular semi-rings, we can get interesting uh, applications of provenance by evaluating, by specializing the provenance to this particular semi And of course the binary trust, which is really the same as the booleans, uh, you can claim that multiplicity is an application, I suppose. This one is a very interesting application. Uh, I, uh, I call it cost here, but in fact this is known in the literature as the tropical semi -ring. Some of you might have played with it. Uh, positive reals. Um, the plus is a min and the times is plus. So it's a little weird. Uh, but in fact, uh, it has gotten a lot of mileage uh, in, in applications to computer science. And an isomorphic uh, semi ring to the tropical semi ring, this one, could be used as a good one for confidence scores. Confidence scores as semi-rings have to, by necessity, be different than probabilities because probability operations per se. But what's really interesting is that these two are related by something that statisticians have used. So the isomorphism to go from t to confidence is actually e, e to the minus x or some exponential to the minus x. And, the other, and in the other direction is what's called negative log. And you might recall the use of negative log likelihood in statistics. Um, there's the fuzzy semi-ring. I shall say no more. And here is a really interesting one. Oh, didn't mean to do that. Didn't mean to do that either. Uh, okay. So here is a really interesting one. So this semi-ring actually has simple operations, min and max, and it has just, just five elements, but it can be understood as access control levels. So think of P as public, C as confidential, S as secret, and T as top secret. And uh, if you look at, what? <laughs> if you look at min and max, they are exactly uh, the operations that correspond to if you have an input item that is uh, secret and you jointly use it with um, an input item that is top secret, then the result should be top secret because you use it jointly. But if you use it alternatively, the result should be secret rather than top secret. Okay, and this can be used. Um, and finally, we get to the semi-rings for provenance, because the title of our original paper was provenance semi-rings. And the polynomials that you have seen before are here. Um, so the polynomials uh, actually form the free structure here. It's a free commutative gener uh, semi-ring generated by x. But there are others uh, that have been considered. And until the semi-ring framework we were not quite able to understand, to compare them, but uh, once we had that, um, it was, uh, for example, the which semi-ring, which as in which tuple, not as in the witch of the wicked west. Um, so the which semi-ring uh, was used by Tsui et al. to compute something they called lineage. Um, the Bunemann, Kana, and Tan paper introduced uh, something they called Y provenance. And don't look at this. This corresponds to computing sets of sets of contributing tuples. So basically a set of witnesses. So each set of contributing tuples, you can understand it as a witness. 
Um, and uh, then if you, in fact, um, consider these witnesses with respect to minimality, you will find that some witnesses include others. And it's, if you consider just minimal witnesses, you find that the result is actually well, a well-known semiring, the semiring of positive monotone or positive Boolean expressions. Uh, which is also the one that you use for um, uh, probabilistic databases that uh, uh, Fokion mentioned. Uh, sadly, this was also called lineage more <laughs> lately. Another use of the word lineage was in a project called TRIO. I shall not say much about that. Uh, so I kind of gave up on using lineage because it's, uh, these are mathematically distinct <laughs> objects. <laughs> um, and there we go. So Peter actually has a, a good saying. He says, well, you know, lineage is for kings. Uh, some scientists uh, use the term pedigree of data. Uh, lineage is for kings and pedigree is for dogs. But provenance is for art, so it's the most <laughs> elegant term that we can use for essentially the same thing. All right, so the best way to understand these different provenance semirings was actually figured out by TJ Green, who is not here. Uh, who was in the audience last night. Uh, and what you see here is also we, we refined this in some sense later. Uh, in another paper. So here's a bunch of um, provenance semirings which I really related in terms of who's the most informative and who's the least informative. And as you go down, uh, you get from most to least. Uh, as you go sideways, you may have incomparable uh, amount of information in them. So I'm going to actually. Huh? What's the comparison? What, what does it indicate more yeah. well. So the comparison relation is purely mathematical, but allow me to say it at the, at the end. Um, but now let me show you an example so you believe me it's uh, from most to least informative. So, suppose, so this is a polynomial of the kind that I've shown you before. Now it turns out that if you consider semi-rings in which um, may you make plus idempotent or you make times idempotent, and you still go for the freeness property, you get this. So look at, compare this information here to this information here. So this b of x, these are polynomials, but you get rid of the coefficients. They are only Boolean, OK? Uh, so you are not really caring anymore about the number of different ways of, that use the same bag. Um, and here in this project, uh, they used uh, something that, that was not counting bags. And I'm not quite sure how to use it, but it, it existed in the literature. So we, we compared it there. Now the next step is actually um, to make this one's idempotent and this one uh, times idempotent plus idempotent. And interestingly, what you get is, <laughs> There's nothing. Uh, interestingly, what you get is this, which is the Y semiring that was introduced by Bunemann, uh, uh, Kana, and Tan. So here um, we have, you can think of this as uh, each of the monomials correspond to a different witness. But notice that y and x, y are mon separate monomials. And in some sense, y is more parsimonious. So, it's not mi so this expression is not minimal. So what you do next is you actually apply absorption. And interestingly, if you apply absorption to the Boolean polynomials or you apply absorption to the y, you get two different semi-rings. This one I mentioned before. This one is the free absorptive commutative semi-ring, where by absorptive commutative, I mean this axiom here, a, b plus a equal a. And commutative is still what we started with. And these are the expressions in the free absorptive commutative, which I called, for some reason, SORP of x. Uh, and this is the Boolean expression. So look how, how different 
how much, how, how low did we go from all this detailed information all the way to just y plus xz, which is, in, it's also very important because this is all you need for certain applications. And just for completeness, I'm going to also put the which semi-ring. So in the which semi-ring, this is a provenance. X, Y, Z, you don't distinguish between alternatives. It's sad. So, <laughs> uh, uh, so each of these semi-rings, well, more or less each of them, is a free semi-ring for a certain sub-variety uh, here. And the application semi-rings that I showed you before are actually also here. Uh, but before I do that, let me explain exactly how the comparison is done. So the arrow, everywhere where an arrow me, uh, exists, that means there is a surjective semi-ring homomorphism, which is an identity on the tokens, on the x's, which are the indeterminates, or as I call them, provenance tokens. So, I, this is a reasonable way of, uh, of comparing provenances, we believe. Um, and adding the, to the picture the application homomorphisms, so if you recall, this is a tropical semi-ring, so if you want to reason about cost or uh, confidence scores and so on, it seems that the right provenance is, has to be at least in this SORP of X. You could use something higher, but then you know you, you have more stuff to get rid of. If you want to reason about access control uh, or about um, you know, just a Boolean semi-ring, about set semantics, then this is the provenance. Uh, if you want to reason about uh, uh, multiplicity, then this is the provenance. Okay. So this is kind of a take-home picture. Uh, it will, this was a very animated slide, so I'm going to have to work hard to unanimate it to put this on the, <laughs> on the website. Yeah, I, I, my finger is, is a little too thick. <laughs> so all the examples that I've shown you uh, satisfy the following fundamental property. Suppose that you have a query, and the query is from a certain query language. And so far, I've only talked to you about the positive relational algebra. Suppose also that we have two commutative semi-rings, k1 and k2, and a homomorphism to compare them, h, from k1 to k2. Then the following diagram commutes. You take an input consisting of k1 annotated relations, and you apply a query to it. You get an output consisting of K1 annotated relations. If you apply the same query, Q, to K2 annotated relations, and you obtain this output, then the same homomorphism that compares the inputs will compare the outputs. Uh, so this, this, there was an instance in your talk this morning which uh, was saying that something is a natural transformation. I suppose you can say here that Q, the queries are a natural transformation, but which queries? So the interesting thing is that, of course, we had to prove this theorem separately for every query language. Um, so the query languages for which we were able to prove this fundamental comparison theorem were, first of all, the um, positive relational algebra queries, SPJU, same as unions of conjunctive queries, data log, Aggregates, by which I mean you take all that with aggregates and with some grouping, blah, blah, blah. But also, interestingly, for a language that actually doesn't use just flat relations but nested relations, at the very end of his talk, uh, Foucault told you, wow, there's a lot more about this, but you know, we're just not going to go there. Uh, to that language, we can also add something, uh, trees with structure recursion on trees, and that works as well. And in fact, we did that because we wanted to derive a result of the same kind about a form of an XML query language called XQuery, and we can do that as well. And there's more. But the relation, if you had universal quantifiers, you could not do the relation on them. Yeah. What does that mean, universal quantifiers? Well, you know, just first of, first of all, you have to have a relation on the 
based on their logic, right? Uh, yeah. So I don't know because negation is a big, big headache. So I can't just say, well, it's negation of negation. Yeah. So in nested relation calculus, you, you also mean the positive. I also mean the positive nested relation calculus, so I, it doesn't, I only allow equality comparisons between base types. Sorry, this was a sort of a rather specialized <laughs> discussion. And when you mention X query, you don't mean that now you've switched to a, a semi structured data, you just. But I, I do, but not, not in this talk. But yes, this, I, I'm, we were able to prove a similar, we were able to define uh, provenance uh, semantics in the same way uh, for some form of X query, unordered X query, and prove this theorem for that. Um, so it, uh, the way you accumulate the, the, the terms on a tree, have you, OK, never mind. That's something uh, we can, I can ask also. Yes. So an instance of, where, of that commutative diagram is what we called at the beginning a critical test, provenance specialization. So suppose we have an application semi-ring, maybe access control, maybe confidence, whatever. Suppose we have a set X of provenance tokens, and we begin by giving each of these provenance tokens a value in this application semi-ring. This corresponds to actually uh, labeling the input tuples with something in this application semi-ring. Well then, because these are, uh, all these provenance semi-rings are free, uh, that H uniquely extends so that you have this. So H uniquely extends from, and, and I mean here uh, most of those provenance, I mean, they, I don't know what happens with trio and so on, but I almost don't care. So um, these are certainly the, the important provenance semi rings are free, and as long as this is a uh, semi ring in which, um, for which this is uh, free, for the, in a variety for which this is free, uh, this will work. And why is this useful? It's because now, uh, once, you know, it's uh, excused, but uh, <laughs> so because now I can, I can do this computation of a provenance once, and then I can apply it in several ways. So you can then specialize it to obtain, for example, uncertainty annotations that you can use in incomplete databases or in probabilistic databases. You can use it to obtain confidence scores. You can use it to access, uh, to obtain access control levels. Or if you have a more general provenance, you can simplify it by actually using another provenance emitting as an application domain. Uh, I'm going to skip this, but not that much. <laughs> So I have uh, you know, about 15 minutes, and I want to throw some teasers uh, into the discussion. Uh, so it is interesting, actually, to think about how we extended these uh, ideas from that very simple case of the positive relational algebra, how we extended it to, say, data log and aggregation. So I'm just going to give glimpses and maybe uh, reasons for further discussion if I manage to um, make anybody curious. So for data log, the problem is that what uh, you define the immediate consequence operator for a data log program P. Let's assume that data log program incorporates what's called the extension of database. Well, in K relation semantics, you can actually um, express this as a function from K relations to K relations because, in fact, um, it is a positive relational algebra computable uh, operator. And now the question is, if you think of this as a function from K rel to K rel, for which nice semi rings K can we find a fixed point for TP? So we know we can do it for uh, uh, sets for when K is uh, the booleans. Um, it turns out that you can also do it, that it was worked out somewhere 25 years ago that you can also do it for bags. But what is a general thing going on? So that's another contribution of the work that we did. And uh, we actually identified a class of uh, 
sufficiently useful. We didn't characterize, but we identified a class of sufficiently useful semi-rings for which uh, this works. And these are semi-rings that were already used in uh, formal language theory called omega continuous, which means what? So if you have a, a semi-ring, in fact, all you have to do is have a commutative monoid, uh, there is a natural relationship in, say, x is less than y, if you can say x plus z equal y. This is a preorder. In fact, if plus is, is the, um, the join of a lattice, this is, uh, in fact, a normal order. Uh, but um, we say that the semi-ring is naturally ordered if this plus is more than a preorder, if it is actually a partial order. And it turns out that all the semi-rings that we've seen here uh, yeah, so it turns out that all the semi-rings that we've seen here are naturally ordered. There, was a, there are others who are not, like the oh, certain Boolean algebras, for example. Or, I mean, the underlying property is cancellation. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so this, this, this is fine. That's not uh, the difficult thing to have. Um, but now what you want to have in order to get fixed points is you want um, chains of these, uh, of these uh, elements to have soups, to have LUBs, and you want uh, um, plus and times to preserve these soups. So this is in the spirit of domain theory, um, and, uh, but it's a simpler situation because we don't need that much. Incidentally, if you have all these things, you can also actually talk about uh, I infinite sums, uh, countable sums, always have uh, an answer. Was this studied by Main and um, I think several people. I think I, I followed um, Kuich. So uh, do we have omega continuous semi-rings? Yes. So most of the semi-rings that uh, I've shown you like, you know, BT, confidence A, even fuzzy, is omega continuous. Uh, but nicely, the various um, uh, yeah. provenance semi-rings are omega continuous. Uh, some of them for very trivial reasons, because there is really no infinite chain of <laughs> ascending chain. Um, now, the natural numbers by themselves do not form an omega continuous semi-ring, but it's very easy to complete them to do so. You just adjoin infinity and you extend the operation the usual way. And now you might think that uh, the completion of the polynomials is just to allow these coefficients, to, but that's not true. Um, so this sort of algebra is not all these things. So instead, you need a formal power series. And actually, this is kind of related to the use of formal power series in formal language theory that goes back to Schutz and Berger. So um, let's denote by n infinity with double uh, parenthes square parentheses here. Um, and this is now the omega continuous semi-ring in which we have semantics for data log. Uh, and it has similar freeness properties and so on. Uh, by the way, the completion of just the booleans, uh, you don't need uh, more than that. So I'm going to skip, um, except to show you that, well, so you see this data log program here on that database? Uh, just for fun, I computed uh, the provenance, and look what it is. So these are, these are the provenances of the outputs. And wow, the Catalan numbers show up here. But it's not surprising, because what is that data log program? It's, um, well, it's a bad way to compute transitive closure, but it's also very related to the context-free grammar for generating uh, well parenthesized <laughs> and uh, dyke languages and so on. Um, in general, though, the, uh, these coefficients are actually going to be from n infinity, not natural numbers like here. Uh, and certain things are decidable, for example, and you can compute, the, given a monomial, you can compute the coefficient. You can even com decide whether it's infinity or not. Uh, there is, as is well known, again, from formal language theory, one thing is not decidable is whether all the coefficients are bigger than one. 
because that corresponds to ambiguity of context-free grammars. So there's that relationship that you can, you can import some results from there. Um, so that's, that, that was it, just a teaser, just to get you to say, well, what would, how does this work? And, and there's, there's actually, so, so when you go to data log, there's a lot, the math becomes a lot more interesting, a lot of beautiful things uh, happen. And uh, similarly, if, when we try to deal with aggregation, the math became more interesting. So what's aggregation? So consider that table there um, and well, this is actually not exactly SQL, but there is a way uh, to write almost this in SQL, which is you want to group every tuple by the first uh, attribute, D, and then add uh, the values of the second attribute. So this is, this is the answer to this query. And now the question is, how can I do provenance? If I try to do it in the style that I just uh, did it for, um, for, for relational, for, for SPJU, um, I have to put something here. But I don't know what to put, because the reality is that um, the obvious desiderata, which is compatibility with set bag and the fundamental property, which we will get, um, have a stumble block. And the stumble block is the polynomial size overhead. If you have a sum of size n, with n terms, it may have two to the n different answers. And uh, the provenance is supposed to capture all of them. And actually, there have been naive uh, some papers that actually considered you know, tables with exponentially many tuples for that. Uh, but we did something different. So we, did a, we uh, chose a solution inspired by linear algebra, although of course here everything is semi-linear algebra, not linear algebra, because there is no minus. So um, if you think for a moment, the relations themselves with union and the empty relation form a K semi-module. The basis of that is the singletons itself. And therefore, every relation is actually the result of a union aggregation. Uh, now I'd like to, instead of union, I'd like to put plus. So I'm looking at, uh, say, real numbers with plus and zero. Uh, and can this be a provenance, uh, a semi-module with respect to some provenance semi-ring? Um, if it can, then I'll be able to do something like this. To write here, instead of 20 and 10 in separate tuples, I will say, you know, a scalar times 20 plus a scalar times 10. Think of 20 and 10 as vectors. It's a linear combination. I still don't know what to put here, but now all of a sudden this is a uh, a reasonably polynomial size uh, expression. And the problem is, of course, that this is not a Provex semi-module. But what can be done is this. We can do a tensor product construction in which we can take a general commutative monoid and uh, the aggregations like sum, max, or min uh, are actually done in commutative monoids and embed a commutative monoid in a K semi-module by constructing the tensor product between K itself and M. So what's going on is really uh, interesting because I used to have numbers, and now just because I want to track their provenance, I embed them into a bigger space, and that's K tensor product M. And in this space, I have uh, scalar multiplication will play the role of annotation, and it turns out that I will have the properties that I would like. There's one snag, which is that you'd like this embedding to be consistent. In other words, should be injective, faithful. Um, and there are some compatibility conditions. But it turns out that in the cases in which it is not are exactly the cases the database people already knew about. So for example, we know that summation doesn't work well with set semantics. Well, this embedding is not going to be faithful in that case. So the result is this. Uh, here we're going to have x plus y, because in fact this is obtained alternatively from those. Uh, again, that's something to argue. And what we have in these tables here are actually linear combinations from this tensor product. 
uh, and that kind of opened up a whole new uh, area uh, of implementing these things because we need efficient ways to, to implement these, uh, these expressions. But from a theoretical point of view, they stay uh, polynomial size. And I'm done, but I have to show you a table because so this is I, uh, this is time uh, from Fokion's. Uh, <laughs> think of the next minute as as part of Fokion's lecture. So there there are a lot of uh, other extensions. For instance, in case of data log, uh, the provenance actually can be infinite, uh, but when it stays finite, it may not be polynomial size, uh, that's a, a result of Karchmer and Wigderson that, for example, Boolean expressions for uh, transitive closure can be of super polynomial size. Uh, but we found a way to do it with circuits instead of expressions. Uh, what uh, TJ did, and there, there are many questions about negation, I think I'm going to talk about negation in one of our half an hour things. Uh, but what TJ did, uh, in his ICDT paper, his dissertation, this is a general paper, is that he actually looked at co uh, containment and equivalence of conjunctive queries and unions of conjunctive queries under these general semantics, where instead of just considering set and back semantics, he considered uh, relations annotated with provenance semi-rings. And it was a comprehensive study. It was a dissertation, after all. So these are uh, results that actually um, might be interesting to compare with what uh, Fokion told you um, yesterday. Uh, incidentally, uh, so this is from uh, the journal paper. Incidentally, the pi to p hard. Uh, and and I you know I cooperated with that. He put it there because you know uh, we it was said to be so by <laughs> luminaries of the field. Uh, but this is a result that uh, that Fokion uh, mentioned yesterday has been withdrawn. Uh, so we still don't know. But interestingly, if you consider relations instead of with back semantics, if you consider relations annotated with polynomials. Uh, then containment uh, is actually in NP. So this is an example of what the Germans call uh, Flucht nach vorwärts, which means <laughs> it's a hard problem. I don't know how to solve it. I retreat from it, but I do it by jumping at something that looks more sophisticated. <laughs> so uh, it turns out that uh, when you consider relations annotated with polynomials, although it looks like you know this is more complicated than n by itself, it turns out that here we do have a homomorphism theorem. This is not homomorphism, uh, something uh, containment mappings with certain exactness properties, and that's what gives you NP. That's also what gives you GI for unions of conjunctive queries. Um, and, and in fact, these are equivalent. And interestingly, uh, for unions of contractive queries for which Ioannidis uh, uh, and Ramakrishna showed this is undecidable, um, TJ showed that, the pro that, that there is a p-space algorithm for it. Uh, by identifying a class of databases of polynomial size, um, finally many so, moduli isomorphisms, it's sufficient to check those. Um, there is still a gap there, probably, because you know, uh, p space is a little too far from where this might be, so we don't know. This, this may still be open. And that's it. So thank you. <laughs> Questions for Van? Yes. Is there any way to capture like the notion of differential privacy using these kind of semi-rings? Uh, I don't know, but um, I hope so. <laughs> uh, we haven't tried hard enough. What if you allow just inequality? The, the thing we discussed yesterday, not equal. That's, it. That's not exact negation. Oh, in the conjunctive queries? Well, so what is their semantics, right? So when you have relations uh, with, um, if you have relations whose tuples are annotated, uh, if you consider 
unequal, you know, you, that's, you can probably interpret that over every, um, any kind of domain, yes? Not less than, but just, so we haven't looked at that. Um, well, he has, too bad TJ is not here, but he might have. I, I don't recall, but we vaguely I have a feeling that he, he thought about it, but I don't know. Because that would correspond to your result, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So as an extreme form of unstructured data, a colleague of uh, Fokian's, uh, Luca Del Faro at, uh, at Santa Cruz, some time ago did work with his students, quite practical work of annotating Wikipedia pages mm -hmm by trying to highlight the trustworthiness, sort of different words and how trustworthy they are or how reliable they are, or, you know. So could this kind of uh, sort of semi-ring uh, thing have any role in that very messy context of, because there, there it's not just separate tuples, it's like uh, sentences are all... It's document annotation. Yeah. So yeah. let me say that we have tried to extend this work in many ways. There is even a paper a long list of authors in which we took workflows uh, and tried to talk about uh, provenance of data in workflows. And uh, the uh, processing boxes in the workflows, we made them, uh, you know, uh, white boxes containing um, computations expressed in Pig Latin, which is a form of MapReduce. And that was OK. Now, what you're talking about is trying to capture um, a kind of processing, which is these guys did, that is completely unstructured. I mean, I don't know. It's just a general programs. So if you just give me, you give me your Java program and you want me to compute provenance from input to output, I, I, it's, I don't know. I mean, uh, I showed you I can do it for a certain way of computing shortest path. Um, but uh, I don't know. So, like the next thing to do is, for example, to take uh, uh, to take um, uh, Kruskal's algorithm or Prim's algorithm, yes, and and see if you can compute provenance there. Um, this is all so sensitive to the choice of the language that I hesitate to make. Uh, the one thing that's useful is this this. Uh, uh, this, this classification of joint and alternative use. And I do believe that that is actually fairly universal. Um, but I don't know <coughs> how to apply it uh, outside of a specific processing paradigm. Um, maybe the, by combining with the work done in information flow, In classical combinatorics, generating functions have been used for such a long time to count all the number of ways of obtaining certain events. Is there any role for that kind of thing here? Um, I mean, in, in some sense, you can see what we did in data log there for that specific case as a very particular case of that. Uh, but the counting problems that uh, um, the design of the generating function is always very sensitive to the formulation of the counting problem. Uh, what we try to do here is still uniform in the, in the language. I mean, as, as Fokian pointed out, I do come from uh, originally from a programming language <laughs> semantics uh, background. So I don't know. I mean, sure. I mean, the Catalan numbers, you, you saw that, uh, yeah. So if you do it for the slow transit closer, what do you get? Uh, something boring. boring. The V star, yeah. <laughs> that's why the, that one is more exciting. But, uh, but that's implement. Incidentally, uh, in orchestra, the, for, the programming language is, is data log with column functions and some stuff. So that, that stuff actually works. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Well, I think I think we all deserve a drink after this boot camp. <laughs>
the organizers and, and the speakers have put on a, at least for me, an amazingly informative and inspiring s series of courses, and I'm extremely privileged to, to be here and uh, experience that. So thank, thank you. With us. Thank you. Thank you.